Zen and the Problem of Control by Alan Watts. As we now know him, the human being seems to be a trap set to catch himself. Though this has doubtless been true for thousands of years, it has recently been accentuated in a peculiar way by man's sudden development through science and technology of so many new means of controlling himself and his environment. In the early days of modern science, the situation was less obvious, for the application of scientific controls to nature and to ourselves seemed to be something that we could extend indefinitely along wide and unobstructed roads. But today, after the Second World War and past the middle of the 20th century, the snag in the problem of control is beginning to make itself obvious in almost every field of man's activity. This was written in like 1960. It is perhaps at every very it is perhaps at its very clearest in the sciences of communication, which include study of the dynamics of control and also in psychology, the study which deals most intimately with man himself. In its simplest and most basic form, of which all its other forms are just extensions and exaggerations, the problem is this. Man is a self-conscious and therefore self-controlling organism. But how is he to control the aspect of himself which does the controlling? All attempts to solve this problem seem to end in a snarl, whether at the individual level or at the social. At the individual level, the snarl manifests itself in what we call acute self-consciousness, as when a public speaker frustrates himself by his very effort to speak well. At the social level, it manifests itself as a loss in freedom of movement, increasing with every attempt to regulate action by law. In other words, there is a point beyond which self-control becomes a form of paralysis, as if I wanted to simultaneously throw a ball and hold on to it to, it, to direct its course with my hand. Technology, which increases the power and range of human control, at the same time increases the intensity of these snarls. The apparent multiplication of psychological disorders in our technological culture is perhaps due to the fact that more and more individuals find themselves caught in these snarls in situations which the, psychi the psychiatric anthropologist Gregory Bateson has called the double bind type, where the individual is required to make a decision which at the same time he cannot or must not make. This is also called cognitive dissonance. He is called upon, in other words, to do something contradictory. And this is usually within the sphere of self-control, the sort of contradiction epitomized in the title of a well-known book, You Must Relax. Need it be said that the demand for effort in must is inconsistent with the demand for effortlessness in relax? Now it is of great interest that we cannot effectively think about self-control without making a separation between the controller and the controlled. Even when, as the word self-control implies, the two are one and the same, this lies behind the widespread conception of man as a double or divided being composed of a higher and a lower self, of reason and instinct, mind and body, spirit and matter, voluntary and involuntary, angel and animal. So conceived, Man is never actually self-controlling. It is rather that one part of his being controls another, so that what is required of the controlling part is that it exert its fullest effort and otherwise be freely and uninhibitedly itself. And the conception is all very well until it fails. Then who or what is to blame? Was the lower controlled self too strong or was the higher controlling self too weak? If the former, Man, as the controller, cannot be blamed. If the latter, something must be done to correct the weakness. But this means, in other words, that the higher controlling self must control itself, or else we must posit a still higher self available to step in and control the controller. Yet this can go on forever. The problem is well il illustrated in the Christian theory of virtue, which for centuries has put an immense double bind on Western man. The greatest commandment is that Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. And note the addition, with all thy heart, and all thy soul, and all thy mind. How can such a commandment be obeyed? The addition implies that it is not enough to think and act as if I loved God. I am not asked to pretend that I love. I am asked really to mean it, to be completely sincere. Jesus' whole condemnation of the of the Pharisees was that they obeyed the law of God insincerely, with their lips and hands, but not with their hearts. But if the heart is the controller, how is it to convert itself? If I am to love sincerely, I must love with my whole being, 
with unhindered, with unhindered spontaneity. But this amounts to saying that I must be spontaneous, and controlled or willed spontaneity is a contradiction. Christian theology has attempted to clarify the problem by saying that the heart cannot convert itself without the help of God, without divine grace, a power that descends from above to control the controller. But this has never been a solution because it is really a postponement of the solution, or a repetition of the same problem at another level. For if I am commanded to love God, and if obeying the commandment requires God's grace, then I am commanded to get God's grace. Once again, I am con commanded to control the controller who, in this case, is God. Or to put it in still other terms, I am commanded to lay myself open to the influence of God's grace. But will I truly lay myself open if I do it half-heartedly? And if I have to do it wholeheartedly, must I not have must I not have the grace to lay myself open to grace? This too can go on forever. The point which emerges here is that the problem of self-control is not made any clearer, but rather the contrary, by splitting the self into two parts, and it matters not whether the self is in question be the human or the whole universe. This is why all types of dualistic philosophy are ultimately unsatisfactory, even though we do not seem to be able to think effectively about problems of control without resorting to dualism. For if the human organism does not have a separate controlling part, if the higher self is simply the same as the lower, self-control must seem to our dualistic way of thinking as impossible as trying to make a finger point at its own tip. We might argue that self-control is an illusion and that man's organism is a completely de determined machine, but the argument is actually self-contradictory. For when a machine states that it is a machine, it is presuming that it is able to observe itself, and once again we have the apparent absurdity of the finger pointing at itself. In other words, to assert that I am not capable of self-control at once implies a measure of self-knowledge, self-observation, and, to that degree, of self-control. The human predicament seems to be a trap, whichever way we look at it. If to deny one's self-consciousness is to assert it, and if to assert it, as seems inevitable, is to be caught in a paradox and involved in a double bind. The division of man into higher and lower selves does not clarify the problem of self-control, because it remains a useful description of the dynamics of control only so long as the higher, the higher will succeeds in mastering the lower feelings. But when the will fails and needs somehow to strengthen itself or transform itself from ill will to good, the dualistic description of man is not only useless, but confusing. For it is a way of thinking which divides man from himself at the very moment when he needs to get with himself. That is to say, when the will is struggling with itself and is in conflict with itself, it is paralyzed, like a person trying to walk in two opposite directions at once. At such moments, the will has to be released from its paralysis in rather the same way that one turns the front wheel of a bicycle in the direction in which one is falling. Surprisingly, to the beginner, one does not lose control, but regains it. The moralist, like the beginning bicyclist, can never believe that turning to the direction in which one's will is falling will bring about anything but a complete moral fall. Yet the unexpected psychological fact is that man cannot control himself unless he accepts himself. In other words, before he can change his course of action, he must first be sincere, going with and not against his nature, even when the immediate trend of his nature is toward evil, toward a fall. The same is true in sailing a boat. For when you want to sail against the direction of the wind, you do not invite conflict by turning straight into the wind. You tack against it, keeping the wind in your sails. So also, in order to recover himself, the automobile driver must turn in the direction of a skid. Our problem is that our long indoctrination in dualistic thinking has made it a matter of common sense that we can control our nature only by going against it. But this is the same false common sense which urges the driver to turn against the skid. To maintain control, we have to learn new reactions. Just as in the art of judo, one must learn not to resist a fall or an attack, but to control it by swinging with it. Now, judo is a direct application to wrestling of the Zen and Taoist philosophy of Wu Wei, of not asserting oneself against nature, of not being in frontal opposition to the direction of things.